Hi everyone. If I can just um, begin by introducing myself. My name is uh, James Ivanatakis. I'm the Pro Vice Chancellor of Engagement and Advancement here at Western Sydney University. I'm also a researcher in the Institute for Culture and Society, so I'm lucky enough to call Tanya a colleague. Um, I want to also begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land in which we meet uh, here in Parramatta and the many lands in which the University of Western Sydney, which has eight campuses, um, uh, sits on. So I want to take that to moment to just uh, recognise that. Um, I just uh, welcome to this panel discussion, which is focused on using media literacy to confront the impact of disinformation on our democracy. Um, I just spent 12 months living in the United States of America. Um, I lived uh, in Wyoming, which is a deep red state. And uh, I, I, I described life as living blue in a deep red state, which was a fascinating experience. Um, what I was researching while I was there, I was there as part of a Fulbright program. What I researched, what I was interested in researching was specifically the state of the Republican Party. And so I joined both the uh, Trump campaigns and uh, a number of Democrat campaigns and uh, joined their email lists and uh, went along to meetings and uh, purchased paraphernalia uh, and really uh, began to try and understand the different um, layers of political, uh, the political situation in the US. I don't have to tell you anything, um, I'm not telling you anything you don't know. Uh, I could not keep up with the level of uh, fact checking that I tried to do. And although it's uh, very easy to point the finger at Donald Trump and he did make an art form of it, his campaign, there was also some real concerning trends uh, that I picked up on um, on the Democrat side of politics as well. So there was kind of layers. And what I've really found interested on a little bit of self-observation uh, was how emotionally engaged I got um, when I read stuff, how I got caught in my own emotional bubble and how I wanted to respond um, when I uh, started um, uh, you know, engaging in social media. And so um, not responding uh, often is probably the best form of response. Um, and it wasn't just with trolls, it was just with debates that were happening online. So, um, you know, Paul, at the, Paul challenged us when he asked us what should we do? How, should, how do we respond to the challenges that we face? And they are challenges to our democracy. If you think about it, I mean, we go back to the foundation of a nation state, which is uh, essentially having uh, a, a story to tell. And the story that we rely on are the stories that are presented to us by national media outlets. But when they begin to fall apart and uh, people from different parts of the political spectrum are reading different media sources, then does a nation, can a nation cease to exist? And I suppose that was a point of the, the heat map uh, that Paul presented. So he asked us, what should we do? And we're lucky enough to be joined by a wonderful panel who are going to help us answer this question. So I'll briefly introduce the panel, and then I've got a couple of questions for each of them. They'll spend about five minutes each responding, then I will open it up to a conversation uh, with, um, with uh, the audience members. I do know a number of people here in the audience, and uh, I know that you have a lot to share, so I really do encourage you to, to make this a, a real uh, engagement uh, and a real discussion. So to begin, I want to introduce um, Ariel Bogle, who's an analyst with the ASPI's International Cyber Policy Centre and a former reporter with the ABC. Uh, next, uh, we have Chris Cooper um, and Reset Australia, um, who um, created the Misinformation Medic to engage citizens in the topic of misinformation during the early stages of the pandemic. And I just had my, vac my first vaccine yesterday, so lots of misinformation out there. I should be dead by now, and I am bouncing a lot of 5G. So if you need internet, if you need Wi-Fi, just come close to me, and you can bounce off me. Um, Deliana Jacoban, the project manager of All Together Now's Media Monitoring Program, another fantastic organisation, and Heather Ford, who's an associate professor and the head of discipline uh, for digital and social media at the School of Communication at the University of Technology, Sydney. So please join me in welcoming the panel. So my first question, I want to throw to you, Ariel, um, if I may, um, and it's got to do with your um, outstanding work in the podcast series on ABC Radio National called Clicksick, uh, where you investigated the way that people are manipulated by uh, quite sophisticated misinformation campaigns. So I was wondering if you could just spend a few minutes um, telling us uh, 
um, what motivated you to to follow this path, um, and uh, and where um, you know how do you think uh, we can respond to such misinformation? Sure. Uh, thank, thanks so much for having me today. So I think uh, when I was looking back at my sort of portfolio of work that I did for the ABC last year, I wrote my first COVID misinformation conspiracy theory story in January 2020. And it was kind of funny to look back on because um, the piece was about a few sort of Facebook posts, things that were circulating on WhatsApp that people in this room might remember. There was a post uh, allegedly from the Department of Disease o Diseaseology in Parramatta, a non-existent um, entity, that was warning people that traces of COVID had been found at tr certain train stations. There was also a Facebook post telling people not to eat certain foods that had come from China. Um, and there were also, of course, the emergent uh, eternal conspiracy theories around um, COVID being a bioweapon, COVID being created by Bill Gates, which I'm sure we've all come across in many, many iterations. And it's interesting to look back at that too, because that was also the emergence of those kind of uh, the crossover, I suppose, between racism, um, anti-China prejudice uh, and misinformation online. So it was the beginning of that. And after we started seeing more and more of these kinds of posts circulating, the ABC actually set up a way that the public could submit the kind of misinformation they were seeing online because of course, there are tools you can use to track uh, these kinds of posts, what's going viral on Facebook or on Twitter. But what people were experiencing was a little more intimate. It was WhatsApps, it was um, forwards on Facebook Messenger, it was email chains. And that, the only way we could get a handle on that is for people to send it to us. And when we started to get this deluge of posts, um, people sending us emails that their dad had sent us saying that, that uh, you know, sort of theories about how to cure COVID, how to prevent COVID, all the way up to those kind of grand conspiracies. We realised people, this was kind of an, such a intimate and community-based experience. So people weren't uh, going on Facebook and just experiencing the misinformation deluge as a kind of solo activity. It was a family-based activity. They were negotiating with family and friends about how what was real, what wasn't. The whole phenomenon of uh, just-in-case sharing. So people seeing that maybe... Um, drinking warm water 24 hours a day will prevent COVID. This was another Facebook uh, post that was going around. People shared that not because they were like, oh, it's 100% true, but just in case it was true, they wanted to keep their family safe in quite an unprecedented and dangerous situation. So I think this uh, radio series that we did, ClickSick, really emerged um, from that deluge, from that database that the ABC kind of accumulated of posts because we wanted to explore that kind of just in case sharing those f the family stories of misinformation, um, not just the grand conspiracies of Bill Gates and Russia and China and uh, labs and all the rest. So that's uh, kind of where the series emerged from. And uh, we also delved into the links between uh, disinformation and nation states and also the phenomenon of wellness and COVID related misinformation, which I'm sure we can discuss more on this panel as well. Fantastic. Yeah, that, 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 that issue between wellness and COVID has really become a, a focus of a lot of investigations in the US. Uh, Chris, I might throw to you now. Um, as the Executive Director of Reset Australia, I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit of, about what the organisation does and how um, your, your work in connecting some media literacy efforts. Sure thing. Um, first of all, thanks very much for having me. Uh, so we are a policy think tank uh, and advocacy organisation sort of rolled into one. And we're concerned with uh, what we call digital threats to democracy, which when the rubber hits the road on that, we're talking about unregulated big tech, unregulated social media platforms, and the harms that are caused by the business model that sits behind those platforms, um, the exploitative data practices which fuel those, that business model, and the attention optimizing algorithms which curate and dictate what content people see on social media. So the harms that that produces is a wide range of issues. Uh, everything from uh, the rise of extreme and fringe voices, uh, the rise of misinformation, um, disinformation campaigns that can undermine the integrity of elections, through to the harm of um, the harm caused to young people and their mental health. Um, and then of course the rise of uh, hate speech and everything uh, in that space as well. Um, we see that these, problems manifest through the manipulation of the user, 
through a couple of different ways. One is through what we call um, unintentional manipulation. It's not they're not they're not what the designers or the uh, developers intended to happen. But what happens when you send people down those rabbit holes into those echo chambers? Uh, you end up with um, you end up driving polarization. You end up uh, when you optimize for engagement, you tend to amplify more sensational, outrageous, conspiratorial content. Um, and this is this is a byproduct of the design of great companies and great platforms. Um, and they're unintended, and they need to be um, fixed. And then there's the other side, which we call manipulate um, intended manipulation, which is where you've got an ad platform worth hundreds of billions of dollars, which enables anyone with a credit card to serve, to target you based off your vulnerabilities, your vices, your interests, uh, with whatever content you want, pretty much. Uh, and that can lead to all sorts of harms, obviously, when it's unchecked and unregulated. Um, we at Reset focus very much on the policy side of things. We see that uh, there's there's a need for appropriate guardrails around the design of these platforms, um, and uh, and that's where we focus most of our efforts. But it's acknowledging that the other side of that coin is media literacy and digital literacy, and so a lot of our policy is actually really designed around transparency to give the user, to give researchers and academics, to give journalists more access to the way that content is amplified uh, and distributed on these platforms and consumed so that we can a uh, give the public um, more more information um, to better their chances of being more informed about the incentives and the systems behind the content that's being recommended and served to them um, but also to inform adequate policy like policy that would see the mitigation of these harms without stifling innovation without you know ending Facebook or YouTube we, we, we don't want we're not anti those platforms we want better platforms um, and so it's the media literacy uh, mixed with that appropriate and considered regulation which is um, which needs to happen together and in tandem and that's that's what we're what we're focusing on thanks <coughs> thanks Chris I mean just just quick quick follow-up I mean is there a tension between the algorithm which commercially has to be opaque and the kind of um, transparency that you're pushing is that how, how do we as a policy group as a policy group try and solve that so i think you don't need to have access to the secret source of the algorithm you need to have uh, controlled access to the outputs of that algorithm and so we um, so in terms of COVID and our policy response to to the misinformation that's proliferated through the, through the pandemic, we um, developed through consultation um, a what we call a COVID live list. And what that is would be access granted to researchers, academics, um, public health officials uh, around um, so that they could see what was being amplified and consumed most in terms of the COVID related URLs on the platform. Um, so that that can inform the rollout of the vaccine, so that you know our, our health departments can could identify um, that there is a lot of misinformation around a particular story that's proliferating in particular communities, um, and um, and that's uh, so that that can inform where the government directs their public health initiatives, or where journalists might correct the record, or where academics and researchers might lead lead some of their research, um, and none of that requires deep access into the algorithm itself. It requires controlled access to the outputs of that algorithm. And so it's not, um, you, can have, you can have both essentially. Um, we, don't think it's it, we don't think it's useful to have that access open to the public. And I think the, both Facebook and Google often talk about the ability of people to game the algorithms if it's that open. And I think that's a totally fair point. Um, but also a completely closed opaque system where you have no accountability for what's being amplified um, particularly when, when profits being made off that amplification um, is also unacceptable. So the middle ground is controlled, um, is a controlled sort of uh, approach like a live list. 
Fantastic, thanks. Sorry, um, that wasn't on the question list. I just asked. I'm just geeking out here, listening to. Um, so, um, Liana, I might, I'll turn to you now. Um, uh, you work with the uh, All Together Now, and for those of you who don't know All Together Now, it's an amazing organisation which was established in 2016 uh, to monitor racism in Australia. Um, maybe I could just ask in your work, in um, as part of the monitoring that you do, um, what have you seen um, and the type of analysis um, you've been undertaking? Thank you. I was wondering if we're able to put up the slides. slides. Yeah. Is it working? Yeah. Uh, sorry, Thanks, Tanya. Gonna, yeah, uh, maybe while Tanya's fixing the slides, um, I could ask everyone to be kind to me today. Um, I'm quite nervous. I haven't done public speaking a lot lately, and especially not since I've been working from home for a whole year and reading news every day, talking to myself a lot. <laughs> Thank you, I'll take that as a gesture of support. <laughs> Do you want to come up with your major later? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Just use the okay. Thank you. So for people who don't know um, who we are, All Together Now is a national anti-racism organization. Um, and we've been monitoring the media for a few years now. Um, and we uh, focus on opinion media, so that is um, articles, opinion articles from mainstream newspapers and current affairs TV shows. Um, the reason why we're doing that, uh, were, there are a few reasons. When this project started, it was a volunteer-run project, um, so we had to narrow the scope of our research. Um, also, um, opinion media in Australia has a big influence on shaping discourses. You will often see um, columnists on the front pages of our national mainstream newspapers. Um, and I think that the importance of scrutinizing opinion media has increased lately um, with the digitalization of news. Um, we, we find that the, the lines between news journalism and opinion media are increasingly blurred. These are the outlets that we are um, that we are monitoring. Um, so we look at the newspapers with the highest readership, according to Roy Morgan, and the television shows, current affairs TV shows, um, with the highest viewership. And over 26 months, we've collected quite a few opinion media pieces, and we've looked at each of them individually. Um, so. Um, this large sample um, was um, analyzed uh, using content analysis and what we looked at was um, whether they uh, portrayed race negatively, neutrally or inclusively. So we looked specifically at race-related opinion pieces and something to keep in mind here is that uh, when we say negative, we don't mean uh, bad news stories because um, of course we... Thank you. So we, of course, know that um, news media and media in general does focus on um, on bad news story. That's the nature of it. So when we say negative, we strictly refer to the portrayal of race. And over the past few years, the results have been consistent. So between 50 and 55 percent um, of opinion media has been negative against um, different communities, so mainly Muslim Australians, um, First Nations uh, people, and with fluctuations over the past three years, uh, African Australians and Chinese um, and Chinese Australians over the past year in particular. Um, so why is media monitoring important? Um, well, it does pinpoint where change is needed and change is needed in on many different layers. Um, and um, more importantly, I think it tracks and it identifies and collects evidence of racism in the media.
Thanks, um, Diana. Um, Heather, I'm going to turn to you now. Um, so uh, you've been, uh, so I didn't realise this, but in 2021, this year we're marking the 20th anniversary of Wikipedia, an organisation that you've been studying for a long time. And I suppose at first it was a bit of a joke amongst academics. You know, the first slide you put up in your first year sociology lecture was don't use Wikipedia. But um, that's changed quite a lot. And uh, can you maybe tell us a little bit about the model um, that Wikipedia uses in responding to misinformation? And what other popular uh, platforms such as YouTube and Facebook can, can learn from them? Thanks so much. I'd love to look at the slides, some, yeah. some show some images, um, if we can. I've been studying Wikipedia uh, for about a decade. And before that, I worked as an activist in the open source movement. I founded Creative Commons in South Africa and um, was on the advisory board of the Wikimedia Foundation until um, when I was doing my master's, I came across um, a story about Wikipedia that surprised me, and that was where a group of Kenyan um, editors had tried to start an article about McMende, which was known as the first Kenyan internet meme, and they'd been repeatedly deleted um, on English Wikipedia because it wasn't notable enough. And so for the last 10 years, I've been trying to understand Wikipedia um, and trying to understand how this really open um, source project can uh, what it has to offer, what its um, strengths are, and also what its weaknesses are. Um, and, and also looking at other platforms, and my main interest is really in deliberation, democratic deliberation, and how platforms enable or disable, uh, or disable democratic de de, um, deliberation. Now, Wikipedia and other platforms are obviously very different, and the most fundamental difference is that Wikipedia is a non operated by a non-profit organization. So um, at some level, the analogy doesn't work, but I thought I'd um, just go through one or two things that I think um, other platforms can learn from Wikipedia. So. One of the um, central features of Wikipedia and the reason why it actually hasn't dealt with the same level of, of misinformation as other platforms is that information quality is actually central to everyday practice on Wikipedia. Um, it's an encyclopedia, right? Um, and so um, the, the concept of accuracy is really important to the work that Wikipedians do. Um, and citation needed is one of the central kind of practices of Wikipedians and editors, where if there's a statement that hasn't been cited and it's questionable, um, everyone has a right to add a citation needed uh, um, tag on that statement. And that's actually led to this kind of um, meme around citation needed in other areas of politics. The second is that most decisions are made in the open, very, very different from the way the commercial um, uh, platforms operate. This is not that um, all decisions are completely open, um, but most decisions are made in the open. A lot of them are made uh, through uh, consensus on the talk page of articles. Now, this is really interesting. Uh, the work of maintaining order, that is removing um, uh, difficult or discriminatory content um, uh, or misinformation from Wikipedia is distributed. So anyone can actually do this work um, by going through current edits or new articles to Wikipedia. You could do it right this moment, actually. You could become part of this distributed network. Um, the second really important difference um, is that content prioritization uh, is actually done by humans and not algorithms. And that's a, a really important difference. Um, so Wikipedia is in the news uh, section, for example. Uh, the candidates for in the news are actually um, offered and developed by consensus. So it doesn't actually happen by automation. There is actually some automation that happens across different port portals, but all of those decisions happen um, using humans. But there's still lots of challenges. One is um, a recent one where Richard Grenell was named the president of the United States on Google, and that was because of an error on Wikipedia, or um, not an error, a, a disinformation act, I guess, in on Wikipedia that was then filtered uh, through the knowledge graph to, to um, Google. And so inaccuracies can really be exacerbated by this reliance. You can see there the edit that was made 
um, by Q was here 2021 um, that that resulted in that um, that interesting error. And that's because Wikipedia actually feeds a bunch of different websites and platforms, all the major ones there, uh, Siri, um, Amazon's Alexa, and Google's Knowledge Graph, and is also um, or was um, used as kind of an antidote to conspiracy theories on YouTube, where um, a Wikipedia article was offered about the cons conspiracy. In that case, it was Pizzagate, if you were searching for for Pizzagate on YouTube. So Wikipedia is really central to this kind of ecosystem um, and it's assumed as this really authoritative source. And I think that's actually pretty problematic for the same reasons that we have these dominant sources that are completely unquestioned in many cases. Uh, there's also been a few long-term hoaxes created and maintained by um, online brigades. And Wikipedia is really good at working against individuals, but not so good um, when there's a lot of different people working um, on a sing single kind of strategic campaign. And this was 15 years long, this hoax, the longest hoax that's ever survived on Wikipedia that we know of. And then finally, the thing that the work that I do a lot on is about systemic bias um, on a platform that is monopolistic in many ways, actually very, very dominant. And that renders some populations and knowledge is invisible because um, what is on Wikipedia is not all of human knowledge. It is really selected by virtue of the policies that, that determine what, what Wikipedia counts as knowledge and doesn't. So those are just some of the, the things that I think platforms can learn from Wikipedia. So um, while you have the mic, actually, and while you're there, can I just ask you a, a follow-up question, which is about, I mean, you, you talk about people becoming um, Wikipedia literate, um, and can you maybe unpack that concept and what we can learn from that um, when we're talking about media literacy? Yeah, I think um, the the term that we, my colleague and I, uh, Stuart Geiger, used when we when we looked at the literacy campaigns that were being rolled out in terms of Wikipedia was trace literacy, and this comes from a um, a literacy theorist called Richard Darville. And he was teaching English to second language English speakers for many, many years. And he wrote a paper and he said, um, what's important is for students to be able to learn how to write up into organizational practices rather than being able to write down, which is about memory. So it's important to be able to write up rather than write down. And um, what he found was that he was teaching these second language um, immigrants, uh, second language English um, students and immigrants, um, how to speak English and what grammar rules are. But what they actually wanted to know was how to write a CV, right? Like how, when they sent a CV, would the CV um, move through the organizational structures of a company? And we use that as a way to understand how um, Wikipedia literacy should be thought about. And that's about um, thinking about how the traces you leave on the system are really about how, how they're um, distributed in terms of the organization. How not only to read or write Wikipedia, but how to fight on Wikipedia. And that was really important. And I think similarly, in terms of digital literacies, we not only want to teach people how to use and write and produce on platforms, but really to understand what kind of relationship they're entering into in the ecosystem of organizations and economies when they write a post on Facebook, for example. What kind of relationship are they getting into? Um, and that's, you know, in addition to learning how to produce on Facebook, how to how to write things, but also learning about the organizational structure of Facebook and other organizations in that kind of ecology. And it is kind of amazing how, I mean, it makes sense, right? Like when you talk about this, it makes sense, but so many of the literacy campaigns are not doing this, right? They really are sticking to this, um, how to produce, how to write, how to read, um, but not really like thinking about it in terms of organizations and, and economies. And, and that is really crucial to becoming an empowered member of the society rather than, you know, a cog in the wheel, I guess. Yeah. That's a really great link with Paul's um, point about 
um, how to in, you know create that sense of agency. Um, Ariel, I'm going to come back to you. Um, I, one of the one of the great things about Click um, Click Sick in the series was the way that you um, identified uh, the way that family members were sort of working with trying to prevent other family members from falling for conspiracy theories. Um, so can you um, can you tell us a little bit more about that? Because, you know, obviously one, you know, one of them or, you know, or not to go down uh, pathways such as swallowing um, uh, bleach and, and so on. Um, but maybe can you tell us a little bit about that and also what we can learn um, from what you from about media literacy efforts from what from what you did in, in your work? Yes, uh, certainly. So um, <clears throat> in the first episode, we wanted to start with, uh, you know, seemingly benign pieces of misinformation uh, and explore the sort of reverberations of those pieces. So the first one, uh, we looked at the story of Lucy. Uh, she was a mother in Melbourne and her son was refusing to go get a COVID test despite getting sick. And when she was asking him why, he eventually showed her a Facebook post he'd seen and it was a, uh, a post that said the tests uh, couldn't distinguish between the coronavirus that causes COVID and the coronavirus that causes other types of colds. Um, so when we took a deeper look at this, of course, the screenshot was actually a genuine screenshot from the CDC in the United States, but it had been sort of removed of context because, of course, the post was actually about antibody tests which are the tests that uh, you might use to see if you did have COVID and do have more trouble distinguishing between various types of coronavirus. Um, and so, you know, it was a complex thing to ask uh, both Lucy and her son to figure out that a, you know, a screenshot that was from a genuinely respectable source was, had been removed of context and now had had this impact of uh, even driving a wedge even briefly between a mother and son negotiating over healthcare during a pandemic. Uh, and the second example we also looked at was the case of Shrihari. Um, so he had his uh, family visiting from Kerala in India uh, at the beginning of the pandemic, and they essentially got stuck here in Australia. And, um, you know, his father was very stressed about the pandemic, was uh, not uh, really able to consume so much English language media and so was spending a lot of time on YouTube trying to uh, get the type of uh, information he needed but in Malayalam, uh, the language in Kerala. And so I do have a clip from the podcast where Shahari sort of tells us uh, what happens after he found his dad sort of staring up into the sun for quite uh, long periods of time for some reason that he was trying to figure out. And that's when 29th of April, I believe, when my father said... Australian scientists have now found out that sunlight is quite effective in preventing COVID-19 infection. You might be thinking at this point, how could sunlight prevent a global pandemic? And if that claim was true, why don't we all know about this? This wasn't the first time Shahari's dad had told him about something he'd learned online that sounded fishy, but this one stood out. The YouTube video he'd seen starred an Australian scientist and he spoke Malayalam. Because had it been a non-Malayalam scientist, I don't think my dad would have been able to gather as much information. Australian scientist caught my attention because that actually legitizes the findings. And, and I said, I don't think it is true. And I'm not sure which Australian scientist, because feverishly I, I've been uh, researching stories or getting up every morning, see what's the situation like. So I was more thinking, like, if, if there's an Australian scientist, how come I miss that story? So that kind of anecdote, I think, also gets at something else that a lot of people were negotiating last year. It's that, you know, the media, the sort of mainstream media is confusing because a pandemic is an evolving situation. The government is not always clear. Health authorities are not always clear. People are scouring uh, the internet for sort of clues about how to keep themselves safe. And what platforms like YouTube, Instagram and others do is, of course, allow anyone to broadcast themselves, but also uh, confer a kind of legitimacy and authority on certain people if they can kind of um, take on the role of an influencer. So in this case, it was a man living in Australia. He does have a PhD, but it's not in anything to do with medicine, but had for some reason um, decided to broadcast instructions to people in Malayalam about um, standing in the sun to prevent or lessen the impact of COVID-19. And I, it, this story also um, 
stood out to me because Shahari really struggled with what to do next. I mean, there was the matter of convincing his dad this might not be the best course of action. But then he wanted to get this video taken down. So he complained to YouTube. He even called uh, the police to report this guy. Um, and the police uh, really struggled with what to tell him because of course it's not quite illegal to give people bad health advice at this point in time. Um, but I guess it points to the kind of uh, the agency that people were trying to claw back when sort of wading through this deluge of information about uh, the coronavirus in the past year and the way that uh, the internet kind of flattens sourcing, I think. So for uh, Shahari's dad in that instance, a news report um, and a YouTube video that kind of had the aura of a news report somehow got flattened because they both look somewhat the same, they appear on the same platform. And um, that's the platform where he was deciding at that point to consume most of his information. Wow, okay, <laughs> amazing. Um, Thanks for that. Um, so, Ariel, what? Um, so, you know, the first example you talked about was about the conflict that this was creating between mother and son. Yeah, I mean, did you come across a lot of that type of conflict where family members did did sort of, you know, it, it's kind of like talking about politics. Is health becoming the new politics? Uh, yeah, I think for a lot of people last year it had become that um, in this database where we had people submitting examples of. Uh, coronavirus misinformation they were seeing online they would there was a sort of box where you could write you're meant to describe like where you saw it and uh, why it was there or something like that but people often wrote really personal statements about what impact that personal that information had had so you know in one case one woman um, she was really worried about her father um, who, who was not taking she thought COVID um, seriously and uh, kept forwarding her emails to explain why he wasn't taking it seriously, that, you know, emails of slightly dodgy sort, um, sort of conspiracy websites and things like that. And it did involve like a negotiation for these people about how much to push back. If you're pushing back, at some point you're pushing back on somebody's identity, not just about their health advice, but they've taken on an identity from the kind of information they're consuming. And I found that quite similar, a quite similar phenomenon uh, amongst families I spoke to who had family members or friends who had become uh, QAnon believers. Um, th people were similarly negotiating how to maintain or whether even to give up certain relationships. Um, in one instance, I talked to a guy who's one of his good friends had uh, become a QAnon believer and he had decided to maintain the friendship no matter what his friend said to him. And in another instance, a son who had decided to essentially give up his relationship for his, with his mother for the time being because he just could not take on her uh, belief in QAnon and the sort of attendant uh, stress that it was putting on his family relationships. So, yeah, I think people have been through a lot of kind of negotiation of their personal because, as I was just saying, yeah, the health, health has become political and has become your stance on things like COVID has become sort of a closely held identity point for a lot of people. And so you can't... Uh, uh, yeah, you can't ask people to give it up just by sending them like a good Department of Health uh, fact sheet mm. if it's become a political identity. Yeah, it's a it's a great analogy. Thanks so much, Chris. I'm gonna I'm gonna come back to you um, and ask you about an experiment that you at, at Responsible Tech ran um, last year about delivering uh, dangerous COVID inf misinformation to people via Facebook. Can you tell us um, about the experiment and and what happened? Sure. Um, so we wanted to, uh, like I think. Thinking about media literacy um, and the role of the individual and the individual agency and the systems within which they're operating and consuming media is a really important conversation. And we wanted to highlight the relationship that the average Facebook user has to recourse to highlighting problematic information or, or misleading information um, and, and highlight some of the problems with that relationship. And so we created a, um, a fake uh, false news site, uh, news page on Facebook. Um, and then we created a series of ads which included COVID misinformation, health misinformation, it was, it was sunlight um, advice, it was 5G conspiracy content, it was voter suppression content, it was content that was, would be deemed like dog whistle racism, um, and a series of like other like harmful forms of um, um, ads and we obviously didn't want to push these out into the public so we recruited a hundred of our supporters to be consenting 
um, receivers of this information. So they saw the ads, they consented to receiving them, and then we uploaded their emails into Facebook as a custom audience, and then pushed those ads um, to them and to them only um, to see if we could get these ads through. And all of them were approved, and we paid to push them to those supporters for two months without any recourse from Facebook, any contact from Facebook. Um, but worse than that, we were also getting those supporters not only to screenshot those ads and send them to us to show that they had been delivered to them, but also to flag them as misleading or harmful or whatever the, um, the options are that Facebook provides. Uh, and despite all of those flags, we never were contacted by Facebook. The only contact we ever had was uh, after that two months, we spoke to a journalist about the story who contacted Facebook for content, uh, for, for comment. Uh, that was the day that Facebook took the ads down and we still had no contact from Facebook at all at this point, nor did any of the people who received those ads and flagged them. And um, then a week later we received a call from Facebook marketing asking if we wanted to uh, go through a free training to improve the efficacy of our ads. Um, that was, and, and what that highlighted was that this user beware relationship, which is where you need to be media and digital lit literate and you report it and we will do something about it is bogus. Not only because even if Facebook is on top of that content and they are getting better, um, by the time they get to it, it's weeks later, the damage has been done, that post has, seen, has been amplified by their algorithms and has been seen by 97% of the people who are gonna see it anyway. Um, so that whole relationship is, is predicated on media and digital literate users in a system and a relationship with a platform that has essentially promised something that isn't being delivered. Um, and so, yeah, that was the experiment to, to sort of highlight that problem and show that, yes, we need media digital literacy, but we also need to change the way that that relationship exists with these platforms and the way that they operate. Wow, <laughs> that's amazing. And um, there's a lot of really interesting um, links there with Heather's discussion around understanding the context which you're playing. Um, I'll, I've got one more question um, for um, Deliana, and then I'm going to open it up to the floor for questions. I'm sure you have um, dozens of them. Um, so um, Deliana, I want to turn to um, the some of the research you've done around uh, COVID and the racism that's been targeted towards Asian Australians. Um, I'm involved with an organisation called Diversity Arts Australia and we run a campaign called I'm Not a Virus, um, which has picked up on a lot of this. But I was wondering if you could um, maybe tell us a little bit more about uh, what you found and what role do you think um, racism, uh, racist social commentary plays in perpetuating racist attitudes relating to, to COVID? Thank you. Can I bring up the yeah, slides again? Oh, yeah, sure. <laughs> Thank you. That's one. Yeah. Maybe I can go back a step because it's important to ask this question. Um, are we actually media literate if we're unable to speak about racism and call it out um, and address it? Um, and in the past year, we've seen conversations around race changing with the Black Lives Matter movement, but. I think we need to ask ourselves, and I don't have the answer, it's too soon, um, is Australia actually keeping up um, with these conversations? And um, in this context, the um, report we put out last year together with the Asian Australian Alliance um, focused on social commentary, racism and COVID-19. Um, so um, instead of us talking about our regular research, um, we thought it'd be good to focus on um, the narratives that were circulating, the racist narratives that were circulating at the time and are still circulating, but most importantly, how they were delivered. Um, and for that, we um, wrote a case study, which was an in-depth analysis of eight opinion pieces. And we wanted to give people, so the general public, but also media workers, um, a tool um, to be able to just look under the hood of these very apparently commonsensical opinion pieces. Um, so we sampled um, eight opinion pieces from Daily Telegraph, the Australian Sydney Morning Herald, um, that were quite difficult to um, criticize because they blur the lines between racism and legitimate political criticism. And of course, a lot of legitimate questions around COVID-19 that everyone was, was asking. 
And um, using critical discourse analysis, we identified um, five main techniques that um, normalized racism and perpetuated it. Um, so the first one is irony. Of course, um, journalists use irony a lot. Irony is not racist, but it can be. In this case, um, one example is mocking Chinese culture. Um, then the second technique was the use of harmful, harmful stereotypes. And I'm sure everyone's familiar with stereotypes, um, but I thought a very interesting one and um, very specific to um, a, a, a very specific to, to this topic and um, Asian migrants uh, was this comparison between the good migrant and the bad migrant. So this was a discussion where a quite arbitrary moral compass was applied to this a discussion that shouldn't have shouldn't be had in the first place of who deserves to be in Australia, who is a good migrant versus who shouldn't be here. Um, then the third technique was the use of fallacies, where we tried to explain um, what are some really mistaken, false ideas, logical fallacies that seem to make sense when you first read it, read them, but then. Um, when you start looking into them, thinking a bit deeper, you realize they are false. And one interesting one was equating anti-racism with being pro-communism or pro-Chinese um, um, Communist Party. And the way this worked was, for example, if a columnist wrote something racist and someone called out that racism, they would uh, reply by saying, oh, you are criticizing, uh, you disagree with me, so therefore you must be pro-communism, which is a fallacy. So it's just, it diverts the, the conversation from the main issue, which was racism and calling out racism. Um, the next technique is intertextuality. Um, and uh, one example here would be um, columnists uh, quoting and using other people who agreed with this, their ideas to say that, uh, look, my idea is popular, other people agree with me, therefore it cannot be racist. So um, I just want to say popularity of an idea has nothing to do with it being racist or not. Um, and the last technique, um, very common, scaremongering, needless incitement of fear. Um, here we identified a lot of emotionally charged language. And of course, being opinion pieces, they they do not have to abide by the same rules that uh, news have to abide by. So um, there was a, a lack of using facts, uh, painting China is dangerous, not even going into you know, the facts behind COVID-19 or the trading relationships between China and Australia. And um, I, I think this, this report was particularly important because it also shows, apart from giving people tools to identify this type of misinformation, it shows how systemic racism that has uh, always existed in Australia is reinforced through the media at the expense of communities. Thank you so much. And I should have said um, before that, you shouldn't be nervous. What, um, your presentation was outstanding. Um, and uh, yeah, relax. Thank you. Yeah, it's, it's, we're all friends here, right? Yeah, everyone here is great. Um, so um, lots of stuff to think about, lots of points. Uh, I think each of the presenters or the disc discussants raised some amazing uh, issues. Um, as you can see, I've, had, I've been throwing questions at them on the run, but I'd like to open it up to the floor now. Uh, we've got about half an hour, which is plenty of time. Uh, to really begin to interrogate some of these ideas and uh, and continue um, some of the themes that have been emerging. So, uh, who wants to go first? Oh, we have by the poll over there. Um, purple. Uh, yeah. If you can just state your name as well, or if you're from an organisation, just so we can know who's part of the discussion. Thank you. Hi, I'm Morgan. I'm from Information and Cultural Exchange in Parramatta. Um, I just wanted to ask and get some opinions um, from the panel about how you, how 
if you've done any work around deep fakes or if that plays into the research that you're doing and where do your concerns lie with that as you know now we we have the process of having to go through and verify truth in text uh, truth in media but what about deep fakes with the technology getting easier and easier to actually utilize um, where do you see that fitting in with like developing better literacy around that Um, I can start out and um, please. It deepfakes is an interesting one. I guess um, you, you might want to split off like a visual deepfake from an audio deepfake from a X Y Z because um, on one hand I feel like maybe the the risk of a perfect uh, video deepfake is a little overhyped right now, but at the same time I also want to recognise that it, it doesn't even have to be that good to have impact. So if you, it, you know, at the moment with a video deep fake of a person's face, um, you need so many hours of training the algorithm that you can only really do it for famous people who have enough, you know, sort of imagery out there to train it well. And even then there are little quirks like the teeth never quite work or, um, you know, the eyes don't blink quite right, you know, but that takes time. So if, if it was a video, um, that you know was put out on Twitter. People see it, they react. Um, it moves markets. It it you know gets a lot of attention, and it's debunked even within 15 minutes. It might still have significant impact. So I guess that's the um, di the sort of balance there. Not overhyping the ability of deepfakes at the begin uh, right now, but understanding the impact they could have. Um, I want to talk especially. Um, it's not as well discussed, but audio deepfakes and audio in general. So. Um, last year we were f sent quite a few audio files that were being circulated on WhatsApp um, and I've also written a bit about podcasts and disinformation. It is so hard to track audio. So you see a meme on Facebook that's gone viral, you can probably figure, you know, use tools like CrowdTangle, figure out where it first came from, maybe it came from Reddit, 4chan, you can f dig that way back. With audio it's so difficult. And I think, especially in diaspora communities, this um, audio file um, situation where audio files are um, forwarded from group to group on WhatsApp or via Facebook Messenger is one that is really um, under-discussed. And honestly, I don't really have the answers to that. And when you add in uh, the ability of deep fake audio or, you know, just emulating someone's voice even, um, you know, it's a, whole, it's a whole new complication that I, there's not really any tools out there that really solve that one for us at the moment. Thanks. Did you want to want to add anything? Or, all good. Um, I, I'll go to we'll go to Bob at the back, and then um, and then sorry, and then yeah, so he beat you up by about a second. So yeah. Uh, right. Uh, thank you, Bob Hodge from the, the ICS Western Sydney. Uh, uh, j just continuing along this line of the deep fakes and so on, because I I, I see the. Uh, uh, the, the, the threat of a level of deception which is on a new scale uh, demands new uh, 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 methods of control. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, what I see in the Australian Media Literacy Program and most of the speakers is uh, what could be called to some degree uh, uh, superficial ta attacks on low uh, hanging fruit. Uh, uh, what do you think is the scale of uh, deep deception, which is not necessarily uh, the, you, you, the, you these tricks like the fakes, but but uh, uh, methods of deception which are so habituated that that you really need to uh, work harder to get down to them and, and to prove them in public. Do you see this as a as a challenge? And if so, what do you do about it? I think yeah. it's such a good question. I was actually thinking about um, this when the keynote speaker was speaking and he was talking about um, the importance of intentionality um, and, you know, misinformation versus disinformation. Um, but actually, I think it's a spectrum in so many ways. Um, you know, uh, marketing students in our universities are taught how to influence. And he was talking about influence being the the key kind of definer of, of between misinformation and disinformation, but um, we're all wanting to influence, right? Some, sometimes we do that because we 
we believe in what we're saying, um, sometimes because we intentionally want to fake something. But it's so true that our culture is really um, steeped in these ideas of needing to influence, needing um, to change people's minds because of what we really believe in. And for me, you know, media literacy is not so much about the ability to define what is true or false. It's really about trying to understand instability. And that's about the fact that um, there's some statements of, uh, about the world that we haven't yet gained consensus on, and that there's instability around uh, large events like coronavirus, where, um, importantly, we, we go through a process of trying to understand collectively what's happened. And in that, um, those moments, those moments might be days, weeks, months after the event has been triggered. There is a, there is these this time of instability, and your know, platforms have started doing this um, and can do it more in relation not to defining events as true or not, or defining statements as true or not, but defining them as unstable. In Wikipedia, they have a a tag. It says. Um, this article is subject to a breaking news event. Please read with care, basically. Um, and, and so we're developing these kinds of grammars which de denote instability. And I think that's really important given the fact that, um, you know, they're really, we are living in an age in which, in which um, kind of instability is everywhere and where there is so much um, of, you know, uh, organizations and individuals and groups trying to influence one another. Uh, I don't think it's helpful even to, to, to some extent to say whether something's true or not. I know that that's controversial, but. <laughs> I mean, just, I, I mean, if I can just follow that thread, there's a, a, an interesting question that follows. I mean, one of the, the things that we don't do as scientists, be it social sciences, or we never give a definitive answer, right? We always say, yeah, but, you know, or the you know, you can never draw those correlations in that. I mean, is this? I mean, is the are the very practices that we follow, like and anti-ethical to to what social media requires of us, which is instant, you know, res instant confident response, which is yes or no. I mean, you know, because you, we won't say that. Like, we'll never say that. Is this one of the challenges? Of one of the one of the the, the I suppose structural challenges that we're trying to confront. Yeah, I think um, definitely, I mean, you're totally right that it, um, social media doesn't enable kind of um, reflection and, and slowness. I mean, it's about speed in, mm. in so many ways. It's about, um, also on Wikipedia, they have this thing where they try and be behind the news always. And it's a constant problem and a constant challenge because, you know, um, they want to constantly be up to date, but they, you know, they have some principles about slowing down. And, you know, Twitter tried this uh, recently um, to try and kind of slow down conversations by getting people to go and read the link <laughs> that you read. We sing. That was terrible. I hated that. Uh, who has time to read these days, you know? <laughs> um, but these are the kinds of things that are going to um, really make change, I think. Um, trying to develop these new kinds of grammars which are about speed and stability and instability and then accompanying that the kind of literacies that develop around that and i mean we're just in the beginning that's the problem we we think everyone should know how to um how to navigate this very complex world but um we're developing new grammars as we speak and i think those will take time to to develop and and yes there will be lots of um damage done in the meantime. Yeah, and I suppose that takes us to the point that Paul talked about in the keynote when he said, you know, it's we're trying to keep up, we're trying to respond to something that's rapidly changing. We just, we just, we just, it's impossible from a policy perspective, right? So. Um, May I add something to that? Yeah, sure, someone Unless said that. Oh, there you are, there. Oh, there you are, <laughs> I couldn't see you there, you're hidden behind There's that. a monitor in the way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. No, I think that's really important. Um, to emphasize and what also Paul said, the human centered solutions and bringing in a framework um, that centers humans as opposed to technological solutions. And I think we see the failures of um, media giants trying to address this issue because it's a whack-a-mole um, game and um, 
I've seen this in, in rel my relatives and my friends um, in this past year where you try to have a discussion with people and they need certainty. And I think that's important to address it from a social researcher perspective because I don't think people always have the capacity to live with the discomfort of not knowing what is going on. And I think that's if um, if we could, um, if the media was, if, if social media um, giants were willing to work closer with, with social researchers, with people who are focused on more human-centered solutions to um, uh, incorporate into media literacy this um, agency, give people the agency to be able to um, live in that discomfort that there is a lot of information out there. Um, we don't know what is going on, but that is okay. Like we do not, not need to Google all the time um, what is happening and then the, get the certain certainty and the answers that are not always factual because, um, yeah. Yeah, I think the only thing I wanted to add to that is, because I totally agree with that and like the human side of it and building human agency and capacity through this. Um, and I, on the technological side though, I do think the, the issue of speed is really important is we've accepted the speed at which things spread now and that speed isn't organic that speed is is amplification by algorithms that are designed to do that and designed to amplify particular content over others that speed is by design and we don't have to accept that that's the way it should be and so like the adding in of that the adding in of friction is really important, um, both from like Twitter's perspective down to the individual level, but also to say that, and, and, I, and I know the platforms are increasingly stepping into this, but when they identify an unstable moment, whether it's an election or whether it's a pandemic, that is a time when there shouldn't be just rampant, rampant amplification of the most sensational content, because that is what will engage people, because people are scared and worried because they want to know what's going on, and they will see that and share it. Um, with good intentions or bad, um, and that's a problem. That's fueling that problem. And so half of it is people, and half of it is is technology, in, in my view. Great, thank you so much. Um, you, sorry, you had the question there. Um, yeah. Um, just to add to what Chris has just mentioned about this notion of collective responsibility and the example you um, spoke to during the you know, initial months of the pandemic, I was just wondering if you could speak to maybe um, the implications of the Australian Code of Practice on disinformation and misinformation and the work that Digi's done now um, in terms of the code that's come through and whether there's been any change you want to speak to or any things um, that have, you know, any ex examples of improvement or progress um, since those examples and, and the case study that, that you spoke to? Yeah, thanks, Venus. Uh, good question. And um, we, you are sort of hedging that we're about to sort of release our, our more, like, better articulated position to that code, to what I'm going to speak to now. But, um, I mean, we came out very strongly against that code um, calling out its inadequacies because it is a code that is designed by the industry um, who have been on top of misinformation from the beginning and yet here we are. And so w like, why is that the arrangement? And also why is it a voluntary code? When we've seen voluntary codes around misinformation, disinformation be enacted in the EU and the architects of that code, the policymakers, have all said this failed because it's voluntary. Um, it needs to be mandatory, and if it's not mandatory, it's something that we see is always going to be toothless and lacking the the um, effectiveness of um, to to rein in the problem. Um, but I also think there was problems with the the process around that code. Um, misinformation was whacked onto it at the last minute um, as if it's some somehow the same problem as disinformation, and while they're related, they're not. Um, but um, for for us, I think that. And, and this feels like maybe a, a sort of cop-out answer to what's needed in that space, but you really needs to be more transparency around the way that these platforms enable the spread of this content. Um, and that transparency needs to be done appropriately, but that is what will enable us to create policies that are actually informed and effective. Because at the moment, we're essentially finding harms and reverse engineering them and backing into these opaque companies that 
that in my view don't have the social, uh, the public interest in mind. Um, and, um, and we're left to sort of, you know, deal with that and pick up the bill of whatever, you know, awful harms are being um, created. And then uh, at the same time, and to trust that the code that they've developed through an, uh, a woefully inadequate consultation process is meant to somehow solve this problem. I it's just, it's a, it's a joke in, in my view. I just tack on to that, that um, just to emphasize like how fresh this space is and even the terminology is debated. Like um, the term that a lot of the platforms like to use now is like inauthentic coordinated behavior. So that's bad, <laughs> whatever that means. Um, so that would, you know, ostensibly be an instance of a um, state-linked organisation using Twitter bots to spread disinformation around COVID or something like that. But um, as any academic in this space will tell you like what that term means, why the platform started using these terms, uh, whether that term is replicable across platforms, does inauthentic coordinated behaviour mean the same thing at Twitter as it does at Facebook? We don't really know because Twitter is the only one that releases uh, the full data sets of uh, takedowns of inauthentic networks and Facebook, YouTube, um, etc. don't, not to mention Google. So one of the things that this um, discussion um, sort of elides sometimes, and of course like the code can only deal with companies like in, on an individual level, but there's also this sort of ecosystem issue we need to look at it holistically because somebody looks at a YouTube video around 5G and coronavirus 5G causing coronavirus, they take that query to Google and they plug in the key keywords that they saw on the YouTube video and then they get sent back into the sort of misinformation conspiracy ecosystem because those terms used in the video are, the, are not the terms used by the media. So one of the most sort of profound examples of this um, and it w is linked to the Charleston um, shooter of a few years ago in the United States where a white man walked into a black church and shot um, you know, dozens of people, I mean, not to um, boil down his motivations or at all into one thing, but when more people tried to dive into his radicalization, they noted that he had sort of uh, taken terms from uh, coverage of the Trayvon Martin shooting, shooting used a term um, called black on white crime, which is not a term that the media uses, but it's a term that racist um, white supremacist groups in the United States use. So when he plugged that term into Google, it sent him right into the white supremacist uh, online media ecosystem. So it's, yeah, when we're talking about this, we have to look at that, that circle and join the dots. And so uh, a code that is voluntary is one thing, but a, you know, a code that doesn't address that white ecosystem is also um, problematic. Can I add something to that, Ariel? Because I think that's really important, the ecosystem. And there's some research from 2018 um, by uh, Dana Boyd that uh, Paul mentioned uh, that looks specifically at data voids is what you described. So where people can search something on Google and because there's not enough good information out there, um, for example, they could search, um, does the Holocaust, has the Holocaust happened? And they will get, um, uh, Holocaust denying articles because people who produce this misinformation who are incentivized by um, digital uh, media giants because people click on this information so um, uh, they will get access to, to a lot of misinformation and these gaps, these data voids are exploited by people who monetize these gaps and at the time in 2018 there's um, the researchers uh, said that there wasn't a fix. Um, I don't know if, if there's been an update on that, but what they recommended was just more good content that addresses these very, you would think, basic questions. Um, yeah. Um, I have a question there, then I'll go to Sajat at the end, at the back. Um, I'm Sukhmani Korana from ICS, Western Sydney University as well. Um, I'm interested in uh, Deliana's research, but also have a broader question for the panel, um, because we are also working with the Asian Australian Research Network. So I'm interested in what you found uh, with the racist media reporting and whether you thought the, there was any differences um, in the kind of racist media reporting pre and post COVID, if there were noticeable differences, which kind of also relates to my broader question for the panel around, I, th I guess um, there is, the issue of media ecosystems and collective responsibility, which, um, which 
in some ways is you know uh, uh, is manageable but i'm i'm wondering if there's a sort of an elephant in the room around uh freedom of speech um and whether that is something that media literacy can begin to um address both from the point of view of you know individuals um sort of thinking they have freedom of speech and the liberal idea of that um as well as uh, organizations, whether it's social media giants or traditional mainstream media organizations kind of dealing with the, that idea of freedom of speech. Because at the end of the day, uh, the bots that do exist, uh, there's not naive individuals clicking on certain links. They are being exposed to certain bubbles because of certain pre-existing uh, assumptions. So, you know, the structures are uh, interacting with this idea that um, we, we, uh, we can say what we want or in this media ecosystem, which is being exploited by um, technology. So I'm wondering if media literacy essentially can do anything about the fact that uh, a lot of people out there think that freedom of speech is absolute. I could start by answering the easy question. <laughs> <laughs> um, Yes, there have been differences in um, racism in the media before and uh, after COVID started. Um, so from our own data um, information, the, so racism against Asian and Asian Australian people in the sample that we're collecting increased by 200% um, um, after the pandemic started. and. Um, the narratives that we've identified or the um, the stories that we tell ourselves that are racist, um, they were not new. Um, they've always been present both in Australia but also overseas. They were just revived. So um, those were our findings. Heather, you look like you're about to, you're stinging to say something about <laughs> No, I think it, it's just such a good point, right? And um, I teach internet policy. I've taught internet policy in a bunch of places. And it is actually really interesting how um, students often, that's the gut react, you know, it's like a, a logic that's so ingrained um, about freedom of speech and how how absolute it is and, and you know, um, how it's not about you know, balancing other kinds of rights and responsibilities. And that's really difficult to to get through. It's possible, but um, it really, it is a big challenge. And, and yes, since I'm designing the curriculum for digital literacies, I will add it <laughs> because that is really crucial, like a foundational element of um, what we really need to kind of get across when we're talking about values. Because I mean, values are really important, but it's it's about what kinds of values do we do we need to really instill? And um, it's a, just a really good point. Um, yeah, I think it's a great, great question. And it's something that we in our work, we come up against a lot. Um, we get um, all sorts of abuse as um, being labeled as um, yeah, uh, you know, senses of free speech or, or whatever it might be. And I think that, um, I mean, first of all, like free speech isn't absolute. It never has been. And that, that's, a, that's a, it's a, a mistake from the, from the beginning. There's plenty of things like our defamation laws are proof of that in their own, in their own way. So first of all, like that's, that's the start point. But even if you want to take the position that freedom of speech is absolute, um, then um, it comes back to a point which is maybe me sounding like a broken record and this is not not my line but it's not about freedom of speech it's about freedom of reach and the difference is that when we had a you know the concept of the public square where you can get up and say whatever you want for the you know for good solid debate which is which is the work of democracy um that's not that's not that's not the same environment in which we're operating now um and you know voices particular voices are amplified over others by social media platforms. And so it's just not the same conversation. Um, if all posts were treated equally on Facebook, it would be an awful, it would be an aw awful platform <laughs> and we wouldn't use it um, because, not, because, because there's different, you know, different voices have different weighting on different issues and it's complex and they have to grapple with that and that's tough for them. Um, but the point is that 
uh, the fact that you can say something and because it's sensational or outrageous or in an echo chamber and it can be amplified and picked up by an algorithm that's going to see that and, and throw it to millions of people, the conversation about free speech is suddenly a very different one and we need to be able to be have a nuanced conversation about it, um, which I think is just an honest conversation, which is that it's not absolute and let's work out as a, as a community and make sure there's proper representation in that, in that consultation around how that happens. Um, that we need to rethink the bounds of free speech. I just quickly note too how um, difficult uh, the, the conversation around free speech is here in Australia uh, when it's so made even more complicated by government and the way government talks about speech. I'm just thinking back in January, post um, January 6, um, Donald Trump's Twitter account gets removed, a Facebook account is, and all as we all know, and then a lot of politicians here in Australia uh, express their concern about that within the framework of it, Twitter taking away Donald Trump's free speech, uh, alighting the fact that we don't have like you know like a constitutional right to free speech per se in Australia, and also forgetting um, the numerous restrictions on online speech the government has passed here in Australia, and you know you could have another conversation about whether they were appropriate with the proper guardrails, uh, whether the consultation was sufficient. I'm even thinking in, even in the weeks following the Christchurch shooting, the government had already quickly, really quickly passed. Uh, the law uh, that forced um, the takedown of what they called abhorrent violent material. Um, so that's a limitation on speech. I mean, of course, we don't want the Christchurch video circulating. It's beyond um, comprehensible that it would be, but that was a law passed for a one video. Do, how is that law going to be used? Uh, we have the online safety um, bill being debated right now, and a lot of people have expressed concerns. It's also quite a profound limitation on certain types of speech as well. So, I, I mean, I don't envy any student or anyone in this room figuring out what free speech means here in Australia. When we debate, we talk about free speech on the news, and we continually pass a lot of laws that restrict online speech. Okay, we've got time for one quick question. I really enjoyed the talk given by the panel. I have one specific question. Uh, during the COVID-19 and after the COVID-19, in new, new normal context, we have seen that digital media, like social media, they are producing heaps of news and reports that goes either supporting the government or opposing the government in relation to its response towards the mitigation of risk at COVID-19 and the provision of the vaccine. To what extent digital media literacy utilize vocabulary to protect the data sovereignty and people's safety and security in Australia? Um, yeah, I think we kind of, uh, and sorry, sorry, um, we've sort of been talking about that a lot, about, you know, about the digital literacy and, 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 and the solution. So we've kind of covered that a, a little bit. But um, did anyone want to finish by uh, maybe looking at the question as asking, I mean, what is the role of organisations like the Media Literacy Alliance to, um, to push digital literacy um, to help deal with, you know, ongoing misinformation campaigns that are not going to go away? I can just add into this to say that um, I mean it's really important. I think a strong, a strong civil society is important to the functioning of any democracy, and that's across any issue area. And this is one of those fundamental issues where the health of the information ecosystem and the ability for the public to um, critically think about the content that they're consuming is is important. And how we do that is, I think, uh, there's there's it's both a role for government, but it's also certainly a role for civil society. Um, and so organisations um, like that are just are, are critical. I think it's got to be a mix, yeah. Yeah, I mean, just to echo that, I think it's really important um, that there's some independence in thinking really carefully about what digital literacy means beyond um, the government and and commercial companies take on what that means. And um, it's really changing. I mean, digital literacy is changing um, and, and those kinds of literacies and grammars are changing. So I think it is really important to have some specialised understanding of that and, and have that in a, an independent way. Okay. Um, thank you so much for your discussions, for answering your questions, um, for your expertise, for your insights. I mean, it was a 
the panel that covered so much, um, but you know, a few of the words that come to you know, one of the words that leave um, leave me with is the concept of nuanced and how um, we struggle to have nuanced conversations, especially in a, in in the world where uh, um, where speed is is of essence. And um, I think uh, Chris's Chris's idea of creating friction in the system, I think, is a, is a really interesting one for us to to reflect on. But um, I want to, on behalf of the organisers, really thank Ariel. Um, Deliana, Chris, and also Heather for their insights and their time here. Uh, please join me in thanking them. Thank you.